what is the best way for humans to communicate with you, with you guys? South America, Africa, no matter where you are, all dogs are the same. So it's the same communication, right? So what's the best way? Tell the humans. Tell the humans for once and for all, what's the best way to communicate so they can connect and have the most amazing relationship with you guys worldwide. Just make it simple for them, please. Go ahead. Why is it so important to communicate with you guys in such a simple way, such a clear way, full of affinity, full of affinity, full of reality, full of communication, affinity, reality, and communication? Why is that so important? Because we all look for a relationship, we all look for that unconditional love, we all look for happiness, we all look to belong, you know, we all look to be part of a pack, or part of a group, part of a family is we are pack oriented species, you know, and we want to have uh, a sincere relationship, an honest relationship. Okay, so Steve, recently you wrote on our Discord server the following, you agree to the construct by default when you don't disagree with it. Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, is the world's greatest living psychotherapist. If that paradox about Caesar is not deconstructed, it isn't understood. Of course, some of the paradox in there is certainly the fact that he's not a psychotherapist in the first place. He is the dog whisperer. So I found this very interesting when you first posted it, Steve. I was wondering if you could potentially go into the fact that you've written he's a psychotherapist. Yeah, he's, um, he is famous, obviously, he's world famous uh, as the dog whisperer. And um, the context within which that was posted had to do with the uncritical acceptance of things um, specifically in that context, it had to do with psychological theory, which is then a form of suggestion which is accepted. So if you don't disagree with it, you implicitly, tacitly agree with it and go along with it. Um, the thing that Caesar Milan points out very, very well when it comes to uh, training dogs and interacting with dogs, they have to know, the dog has to know whether you agree or disagree with something, something maybe that it does. Uh, and if you don't disagree with a behavior, perhaps that isn't right with respect to the balance of a family within which a dog is a member, then the dog will start to exhibit all sorts of symptoms of distress, which disrupt the family. And fundamentally, this has to do with the fact that dogs are instinctive. Everything comes through instinct. But um, with humans, it's complicated because it's overlain with the capacity that the cortex has for generating both sense and nonsense in terms of its experiences. So we're very open to suggestion in ways that a dog isn't open to, we could say. It's, it's very easy to work with dogs compared to humans if you do the right things. And the way that he does it, and he does it really, really well, is that he understands that dogs are instinctive. <coughs> Um, and that they have very, very simple needs. And if they're met, then a dog will be happy and live without distress. Humans, though, are complicated, of course, because of the cerebral cortex, which, as I say, has the capacity to generate both sense and nonsense, which as a polarity equals fundamentally the groundwork for neurosis, which is a division into a polarity. So the extension from that is as follows, more or less anyway, and that is that when Caesar Milan works with a family, he treats it as a pack of dogs, even the humans. He talks about uh, dogs having humans more than humans having dogs. The dog is there to imprint its instincts on a pack. And if the pack is operating optimally, as I say, the dog is happy and, and the, there's no neurosis in the dog. It's the same though for humans, and this is the paradox. This is the absolute paradox that if we live by our instincts, then we will be free of neurosis. It is that fundamental. And when we don't live by our instincts because of the pressures, suggestions from other people that we don't disagree with, in other words, we lack ego strength, for example, then we start to get out of kilter with our instincts and instinctive pressure ramps up 
in a, a bid to bypass our defences. Um, of course, we don't allow that. We try to suppress and then eventually repress those instincts. That generates neurosis, and we know what happens downstream from that. There's just about every uh, imaginable kind of human distress and suffering that follows on from it. But of course, we can't just act by instinct without consideration of the outside world. The problem then uh, boils down to just what is instinct, how instinct uh, can be defined in a human sense. Is this as simply uh, structured as a, a dog's instinct? Up to a point it is, but there's more. Uh, we share brain structures with dogs, for sure, of course, but we do have an evolved brain, which has gone beyond that. And then there's this very obvious but neglected and fundamental fact that instincts themselves have evolved in humans in lockstep with our evolved brain. Instincts are not reflexes. They are anticipations of action in the world that in incorporate entire scenarios. We've discussed this in a recent seminar and a video which will be released on that. So in that sense, Caesar is the world's greatest psychotherapist because he knows that when he goes into a family, a pack, that includes one or more dogs with their humans, that he doesn't have to correct the dog so much as correct the people. The people then, when they're in distress, neurotic distress, have an overamped cortex. They think far too much. They don't feel, they don't connect with their instincts. The dogs pick up that distress. So he trains humans to access their instincts and then they get into alignment with the pack, which is the family as a whole, and the dog then begins to exhibit normal behaviour. That's pretty much it, isn't it, on that level? Yes, it is. I mean, you have to, I think what you have to bear in mind, and it's such an obvious thing to say, really, is that dogs aren't humans. Mm. As you rightly say, our, our cortexes are evolved and, and evolved differently um, to cope with the outside challenges uh, of the world. And in order for a dog to meet its own needs, then it has to be treated like a dog and not a human being. Yeah. And, and so often you see this, don't you, that the dog, dogs in families become an extension of the family. They almost become like them as a child. Yeah. And that's the thing that he tries to correct for, um, even down to how he instructs people to interact with their dogs so for example uh, and it's an expression he uses very commonly he talks about um on first having contact with the dog particularly if it's a strange dog that there should be no touching no talking no eye contact yeah. and that allows the dog to pick up on the human's energy and to decide whether it not or not it wants to interact with the human yeah. and that for, for him, that's a kind of a bottom line in terms of the interaction and that that, that should be respected. Mm -hmm. And also, too, he picks up on the idea, uh, as you say, Steve, of, of a, a family um, being a pack mm -hmm. and that there will be um, various uh, interactions within the family for dominance as well and that, and that includes the dog by extension, too, and that if you don't assert yourself within the family as the pack leader, then the, the dog will start to become dominant and, and express, um, you know, undesirable behaviours. So they're all important elements of, uh, of how he tackles um, problems that occur in families where the humans don't properly understand a dog's instinct and therefore the dog's needs. Yeah, and of course the humans don't understand their own instincts. No, so they when they, they project oh. a maternal like or even a paternal like instinct onto a dog, they're not understanding that the dog is not a human being. Mm -hmm. But what you're seeing is a cathexis of instinct into the dog yeah. symbolically. So that is bound to disturb the animal. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of fundamental issues there, isn't there, to do with instincts? Yes, there are. And um, I mean, we've seen it in our own families. Mm. Uh, in te you know, and we've, we've had dogs, your family in particular yeah. um, has had dogs. And, um, you know, you, you can see how they're treated as pseudo children yeah. very often. I mean, yeah. you hear people referring to them as, you know, they, they, 
you see such things on Facebook, for example, as, um, you know, this is the dog's mum and dad. And mm. uh, sometimes um, the dog will be referred to as son mm. uh, and it, it will be weaponized mm. too um, yeah. Yeah. in relationships where there are different difficulties so all those things are, are contraindicated for a yeah. happy healthy instinctive animal yeah he goes on about nose eyes ears with he the does. dog yes. literally the way that they they go back towards the brain yeah and the first way that a dog will process things is through smell then by sight and then by sound everything has to do or is processed uh, instinctively by a dog on a sensory basis mm. And uh, humans today are very much out of touch of their sensory experiences, uh, but we're drawn to dogs. Yeah. And dogs are like wolves that never grew up. They're like puppies compared to a wolf. Um, and uh, wolves treat adult dogs as if they were puppy-like. Yeah, they do. They're immature. And that, that says something. Mm. And there's an awful lot there. But um, this idea of agreeing or not agreeing, or not showing that you disagree, you don't have to do it aggressively. Mm. That's how he deals with aggressive dogs. He disagrees with it, mm. but he doesn't beat them or anything like that. No. He's very, very slow, methodical, relaxed. He controls his energy when he deals with an aggressive dog. Yeah. Um, and the dog then realizes that the human, Caesar, does not agree with his, his behavior and changes. Yeah. Well, he reclaims the space, doesn't he? he Even does with that, an yeah. aggressive dog, he'll. Yeah you know incrementally moving closer to it which is clearly a, a territorial thing yeah. it's asserting yeah. those boundaries and, and allowing the dog to take its natural place mm. within the family yeah now we, we can extend that out into the world uh other people who want to take our space yeah um other people who want to take our resources and they do mm. it's competitive the world is competitive um we can agree with that or disagree with it and you can disagree with it in a gentle way, and I don't mean weak, assertive, but gentle, yes. by copying the same method of claiming your space and your identity, your boundaries, mm. working on satisfying your own instincts, making sure that other people's needs and yours are contingent upon one another where you need to collaborate, or you don't collaborate with them. They're not in your pack. You, you, you move away. These people are toxic. Their instincts are, are counter to your own interests. So you protect yourself by working instinctively. Yeah. Um, and you can do that also in engagement with ideas and influence. Uh, a guru, an internet guru, is a would-be pack leader. So they're going to work on your instincts. If, if you want to persuade some, somebody of anything, the instinct is the, is the thing to go for. It's as if there is an unconscious algorithm which runs and says, this meets my needs. I will agree with it. I won't disagree with it. You know, on, on balance, it appears to be that way, but that's a cortical issue for humans. It starts there, and then it sinks down into the limbic system, starts to feel okay. Then it's down to the instincts, then it's down to the genome, and suddenly you become a sheep instead of a wolf. You know? A sheep in wolf's clothing, you might say. Mm. with respect to an internet guru who's delivering suggestion that way. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's how oppressive governments work. It's incremental. They give you an opportunity to disagree at first, <clears throat> and then they'll provide all sorts of con contingent reinforcements based on your instincts. And th th there is an animal model for this, something called instinctive drift which is if, if you remove conditioning and a behavior mod modification sense from an animal, what you've conditioned them to do will likely deteriorate. That's how it's considered in psychology, a deterioration when something moves back towards its instinctive base. But the animal itself, to retain its homeostasis, will move towards instinctive drift for its own, to meet its own needs. It's automatic. So... If you then design an, an intervention to control a group of people or an, or an individual even, if you do it at the level of instinct, you will not get instinctive drift. You know? So the suggestions that you deliver are much more likely to take. Group pressure <coughs> with humans is to pack on uh, an, you know, a, a much more amplified scale. So if a government wants to control how people think, 
they can do it through the media, they can do it through controlled social media, anything like that. They can impose things incrementally which are damaging, but the suggestion is this is all about instinct. If you don't do this, you will die, or other people will die, and then mm. you will be blamed for why they're dying, that kind of thing. If you think about it, that is not rational, that is appealing to instinct, instinct for survival. And the population don't disagree, because they don't disagree, they go along with it, and there is no instinct to drift. So the intervention then from a government, if it were using such techniques, would take minimal effort and have maximum return for the longest period of time. So you're getting a pack hierarchy dominance when that's being used. When you mentioned that wolves treat puppies or treat our dogs like puppies, that really interested me. It got me thinking. Do you ever see instances of you know, say classical neurosis in a wild animal or is it only in domesticated animals that one could see neurotic behavior in well, no, you, you, see, you see neurotic behavior in in uh, wild animals certainly and what what you will actually see very very quickly a panxepian uh, induced neuroses to do with status usually in hierarchy uh, an animal a social animal's place in its hierarchy and its health its long-term survival positively correlated whether that's a primate whether it's a wolf whatever and, and we have that too so again if we're out of kilter with our instincts our capacity to adapt is compromised severely uh, and one of the poorest indicators of, of mental health has to do with status with respect to a reference group whatever that might be if people humans don't feel as if they have value and a place upon which to stand they become rootless there's this common fantasy about a lone wolf you see that a lot you know among some boyos certainly and that's a compensation because you cannot be a lone wolf and survive lone wolves don't survive lone wolves are outcasts mm -hmm. if they encounter a pack they're torn apart they have to join a pack in order to survive and then what place do you have in your pack so we have an instinct to form groups and this is why internet gurus are dangerous or one of the many many reasons why internet gurus are dangerous they will manipulate instinct to, to persuade people to provide them with resources and support at cost to their own through influence which is always based on suggestion of instinct if it were merely cognitive it'd be simple to mm. dispense with the negative influence of gurus but no it's always at the level of instinct that the manipulation is deployed so when it comes to status then, as you say, one of the biggest factors behind mental illness and presumably anxiety, depression, etc. around that. Um, what role does the self-concept play in that? And I say that because someone can have great status, we'll say, but feel like they're not worth anything, if you know what I mean. So there's status and then there's like, perception of status or reality perception of status or something like that i've wondered that for a long time yeah i was wondering if you could help out absolutely yeah that's a really good point with us again because we have such a complicated social brain uh, and it's so plastic in terms of how it can react to things this is basically complexes to have a, a learned cognitive and of course an emotional limbic and ultimately a bottom out instinct uh, structure to it that that's where the harm is done principally for people because it's the way that we interpret our status what else is feeding into that hence people say oh you know i've got all this wherever it might be but the life still feels hollow and empty and then something like the personal myth process can be very handy because you can go back and find when the, the maladaptations were laid down and always it has to do with lifespan developments under instinctive pressure so the realities of the world that were not adequately solved and then a complex forms very often as a defense mechanism and you know complexes um, as i say evolve dynamically from a defensive response very often uh, and what the ego does then is that it divides it partitions itself and it produces a system of adaptation based on what freud called repression which is the conscious pushing away of something that doesn't reduce anxiety though completely the thing that appears to reduce that is repression 
So the suppression becomes completely unconscious. That is a gap between suppression and repression within which complexes gain their autonomy from the ego. And once they're autonomous, they function as an independent program and an independent filter. They were set up under conditions of protection for the ego, this kind of complex anyway, that we're considering at, at the moment. But what it does after a while is it sees any attempt to countermand the instructions and the conditions under which it was created as being a threat to the ego, even if the ego is trying to recover control of that which it devolved when it, it partitioned itself to the complex. So then the complex is an autoimmune, if you like, uh, reaction to the ego and attacks it. And it can do that in a number of ways principally by continuing to affect or canalize instinctive pressure away from being available to the ego to act into the world and into all sorts of distractions, displacements, uh, beliefs, uh, suggestibility, all of these things, anything to stop the ego accessing the instincts because under those specific conditions, when the ego attempted to meet the world through the instincts, it was a failure in adaptation, which was so traumatic that the ego split, generated the complex, which then goes off. It's forgotten about, and then it acts autonomously, and it caps instinct and diverts it. But the instincts will not put up with being capped, and they'll push harder. So eventually, the anxiety that reaches the ego is overwhelming. Even the complex cannot stop it. It tries, it ramps it up. And the ego feels then there's a war going on, doesn't understand what it is. On the one hand, the instincts are pushing, the complex is suppressing or repressing. And it's stuck in the middle thinking, what the hell is going on? Meanwhile, the outside world is changing. They're getting older, new lifespan adaptation challenges emerge, and they are repeatedly failed as well. And the complex will then say, in effect, look, it's the same as last time. I'll have this too. I'll, I'll absorb this put it into my core, the nucleus of the complex, strengthen it, and then as more instinctive pressure comes up in compensation, siphon off your libido and support only that. And then you might get further reactions to that from the ego. So the ego splits again in an attempt to deal with the complex, which it can't do because it doesn't know it's there, even though it's within its self-concept and its timeline. And that secondarily split off complex will then conjoin with the first one and the thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, we have a loss of investments in life itself. Uh, well, I was Could just going to say in, in broad terms, really, to uh, in answer of uh, James's question, for people who have sort of navigated um, Freud and Adler and, and, and who have um, status, who, who've, who've achieved some sort of status in their lives that usually the element that's missing is meaning. Yeah. And this is why people turn to Jung, of course, yeah. because they believe that that's the place that they will, will find meaning. Mm. Um, and well, we know the traps that are involved in that uh, essentially are ones to do with uh, being so immersed in in the fantasy uh, of what that meaning might mean that people don't then actually live that out in, in their real lives. That's and right. this kind of comes full circle really to some extent in terms of what we're talking about or what we were talking about earlier with respect to gurus mm -hmm. and probably really why we mentioned see, mentioned Caesar Malam because arguably he's an internet guru as well in some regards mm, he is um, but not but, a, yeah, yeah, yes yeah, sure. yes yeah. but um not um not in the same way that we think of some of the other people that we've no. mentioned in no. in the past no. and I say that because it, it's useful I think to look at the difference between um mm him as an individual and some of the other people that, that we've mentioned, we don't have to obviously no, mention no, names no. here, it's probably obvious um, who sure. we might mean. Uh, and I think part of the reason that we've decided to, to do this video as well is, is, is the contrast between somebody like Seasonal and some of the other people that we've mentioned, because the thing, the standout thing for us, if we were to approach both, well, I think, you probably know who I mean, but yeah, yeah, I was going yeah. to say both those individuals uh, or other individuals yeah, yeah, too, yeah. if you want to, to include other people in an instinctive way, 
Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. To, yes, to, to not sort of process things um, in a, at, at the level of cognition, to mm. sort of think about what, what somebody might mean um, to you. We actually allow ourselves to have a purely instinctive reaction to their energy. Yeah. Then that's very instructive. It is. Because there is such a, a massive difference just purely in terms of persona and presentation. That's the first thing that you meet. And intention. And too. intention yeah. too, of course. Which you feel, don't you? Which you do energy. feel through yeah. through your energy. But you can't do that unless you do it in an instinctive way. Yeah, that's true. That's very, very and true. And then you, you pick up on the energy. You have a different kind of resonance with respect to one person as opposed to another. Mm. And... That, that left us certainly when we were discussing it uh thinking about our own personal reaction to that and uh why one figure is is arguably so much more um healthy healthy yeah. yes than the other yeah i'm sorry to have to talk sort of in riddles about no, it because no, okay. i don't want well, to we, actually we, sort we of mention we people's know, names well, we but they are. So yes we, we, we do them off the, yes we the, can the, the caesar is very very different isn't he He's, yes. he's interested in his things, but he yeah. doesn't manipulate them in a harmful way no. because all of his animals and where he is now um, at his dog psychology center, yeah. as he calls it, yeah. he's living with all sorts of different species of animals and they all get on. They do. So yes. Animals that they you do. would not believe would communicate with one another do mm. and they follow him around. And there's, there's an analogy. Some of these Pied Pipers on the internet psychologically at least get the their followers to follow them, heading off towards very, very dark and destructive things. But what Caesar Milan's doing is giving these animals a really great life where they're fulfilled and happy, yes. all their needs are met, they and are. therefore there's no stress, there's no aggression, the hostility's gone and the contentment is mm. present. Mm. If you can do that for people, that's yeah. positive. Yeah. But if you lead people towards darkness and abyss, nihilism, phanatos, I mean, Caesar would say, for example, if, if you express misery, if you express illness yourself, other animals will back away from you. And they do. Dogs will back away they from do. you. Yeah. If, yeah. if you if you're severely depressed and you withdraw and then, yeah. then the dog's energy changes and the dog's reaction yeah. to you changes yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. Whereas if you express health and calmness, he says that all the time, you have to be calm. Mm. And if your energy is calm, a, a dog will sense that straight away. Yeah. So first of all, you're not a threat because you're calm. Yeah. So the dog then becomes interested and will approach you as well as sniff you, you know? Yeah. Sometimes in unpleasant places <laughs> that you wouldn't normally ask your friends yeah. to sniff you. But they do because that's the dog way of finding out who you are. Yeah. And when Caesar says no talk, no touch, no eye contact, mm. you don't talk to a dog, you don't touch it, you don't make eye contact, the dog feels safe. Yes. You're not a threat. You're not yeah. standing up straight with your shoulders back. Mm. And strutting towards it, barking literally yeah. with your with aggressive energy. Well, yeah. Well, well, that, but that's that's so true because, uh, as I say, with respect to Caesar, he does not come across whatever the truth of the situation. He does not come across as someone who's angry no. with the world. No. As you say, he's gentle, he's calm, but assertive, and it's a very yeah. powerful combination, really. Very powerful skill set. Yeah. And and in many ways, want to be inspired by and yeah. and and potentially to emulate as well yeah yeah he's self-made he is self-made uh, he's an immigrant he had nothing no um when he entered america no we used to uh, sleep under uh, yeah, uh road, bridges, road bridges yes road yeah. bridges and the um, like yeah he did he built himself up through contact with animals and through having a positive healing energy mm. but for sure they don't want to know if if a, if a human is is bolt up right shoulders back yeah. aggressive barking glaring yeah um, no, they, they want positive energy, and psychotherapists should yes, be like that. They should. They yes. should be receptive to people's instincts. They, they should yeah. generate something that communicates with others, yeah. which is healing and healthy. That's rapport. He has fantastic rapport. He does. It's all on the basis of instinct. Yeah. So you, what you could do is a very simple thing that you could do, an instinctive question you could ask yourself is, which pack would you prefer to belong to? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I wouldn't have a hesitation on that one. I wouldn't have to think about it, which suggests it's an instinctive response. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, to have a, as you said earlier, Pauline, to have an instinctual reaction to both of those camps, yeah. I, yes. think, I think it is the most important thing because yeah. I, can, I can see 
see arguments to the contrary that are not based in instinct at all. Um, for example, well, we, we one might need this particular guru for X, Y, Z moral reason, or instinct is bad because, yeah. well, instinct. I think we talked about it recently. Instinct leads to destruction and chaos and everything. Yeah, that it's just animalistic. Yes. Yeah. 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 But but it's... human beings are animals, yeah. but we are human beings. So it sounds like a sleight of hand to me. Mm -hmm. And you guys have described before instincts as being biopsychosocial, yeah. and they have to be. So the idea that like civilization is anti-instinct by necessity. So I, I don't think that that's necessarily true because no. we, we, we've evolved to live together. If it's a big system or a small system, it's all the same thing. It came from us in the first place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they are biopsychosocial. And yes, that's in the history of that psychology that people have taken that view. Uh, Freud and Jung both did in different ways at, at different times. That was part of the, the zeitgeist with uh, pressure from Darwin against religion and then the compensation for both that surfaced in the form of Frederick Nietzsche mm. and how both Freud and, and Jung reacted to Nietzsche in their own ways. Then as Nietzsche receded into the background of uh, public consciousness, which he did just as a philosopher, a curio in many respects to do with the way that the intellectual spirit of the age was moving, Jung himself then be, also began to duck down below the level of conscious awareness. But Freud is, it, most people have heard of Sigmund Freud far more than Jung, but Jung is popular with a certain group of people on the internet who pair him with Nietzsche and with other things. And we know what can happen when, when that goes wrong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the biopsychosocial part of instincts is important. An instinct is a resonant pattern of interaction between different uh, levels of systems which make us up as human beings. Some are biological, some psychological, some social and environmental. Any instinct as a snapshot is operant at all of those levels simultaneously and dynamically. So if you were to take a snapshot, say a, a, as a therapist, you would see exactly how that person was functioning at that moment in time. Um, that's the most important thing you've got because that's an indication of health and activity overall. It will give you the, the ground upon which the figure of complexes and maladaptations have emerged. And of course, the mistake is to, to focus on the figure and ignore the ground. Without the ground, the figure has no context, none. You cannot understand the figure, what presents without understanding the background. And that's like a kind of a, an out of focus, sideways glare, if you like, or stir that you might make at something to see that whole picture. But if you really focus on someone in that kind of eye bulging way, you miss meaning, you miss it all. Yeah. And that's why hyper rationalism is wrong when it comes to working with people psychologically or psychotherapeutically, certainly. So, so the natural question that then follows on from what you mentioned there is how does one return back to their instincts? Right. Well, if, if you have to, thanks, James. If you have to uh, follow any internet figure, have a look at Caesar Milan's work, the original Dog Whisperer, and see how he handles instincts of a, a family unit that includes a dog which lives mm. by its instincts. Then look at where the humans are out of kilter with theirs. Model what it means to be in touch with your instincts in that way. That's ground state. That's baseline. Don't go near any of these these internet gurus in the biosphere. Don't, they're lost and they will lose you. Go back to something that's that fundamental. Maybe you can get a dog yeah. and relate to it in the way that Caesar encourages you to relate to it. Check yourself and say, if you have a dog, have I been doing this wrong? Have I been treating the dog as a projection of my own unconscious mind and therefore of my complexes? What have I done with my instincts? Does the dog act them out by proxy and I've neglected them? It, you can learn so much from that. That's the baseline. Then in a layered sense, start to educate yourself on the Panksepian instinctive systems, eventually surface into a psychodynamic model that will include Freud, Adler and Jung. Eventually, once you've understood what instinct is, feel the instinct yourself, relate to the world through them. You'll find that most complexes atrophy and die when you have proper contact with your instincts. And that is why Caesar Milan is the world's greatest living psychotherapist even though he isn't one. Junior, that's actually a good question. Who do we follow? Who do humans follow? Well, you guys 
pretty much your mom and your dad is your role models for everything, you know? Give you birth, teaches you about life, and it also tells you about the rules, boundaries, limitations, and that's your, pretty much your government, right? We humans have so many people that we follow. We follow our parents, we follow our teachers, we follow our government, we follow actors, we follow athletes, we follow artists like singers, we follow, oh my God, we follow super smart people, you know, you can follow super smart people, you can follow spiritual people, you can follow loving people. Oh my God, there's so many things. The thing is, we are the only species, it feels bad to tell you this, but we're the only species they follow unstable leaders, the only one, only species on this earth, they follow instability. Don't ask me why, I don't know who came up with that idea, but I always make sure that I am calm, confident, love and joy for you, because I know that's the energy you follow, and that's, and that's all I can do for you. You guys live by the PAC code, honesty, integrity, loyalty, I am honest in loyalty with you. Pursuit of happiness. We go to places, we have our own ranch, we have different uh, family uh, animals that we have. I only make sure that people that have good energy is around you. You know, I, I love you unconditionally. That's something that I learned from a dog and from my mom. And the, the, the senses, I make sure that you do your nose, eyes, ears, that you practice, you, you exercise discipline and affection. You know, and I make sure that I, if I feel, you know, sad that day or if I feel stressed out because the human world is very, very stressful, um, that I don't bring that energy to you. Because I don't ever want you to believe that I am an unstable pack leader. No way. Well, that was a good talk, man. That was a really good talk. It's almost like Sunday surrender type of thing, but uh, it's more like a wisdom surrender. You share a lot of wisdom. Let's go, come on, so you can go play the ball.